Okay. Um, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's JKMR Sydney Friday seminar. Um, my name is Nathan Fox from WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Centre here at the University of Queensland. Um, thanks everyone to, today for joining us in here and also online. Before we begin, on behalf of the SMI and the University of Queensland based here in Brisbane, we first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to their ancestors and to their descendants. Um, today, it's a pleasure to introduce today's speakers, um, which include Dr. Evelyn Mervyn from Anglo American, Thomas Jones, and Jordan Petraeus from University of Queensland, who are PhD candidates. Um, by way of introduction, Evelyn holds a BA in Earth Sciences and Arabic Language from Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and a PhD in Geology, which was awarded jointly between MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, Evelyn is also studying part time for an MSc degree in carbon management from the University of Edinburgh and is currently working as a project, senior project geologist for Anglo-American here in Queensland. Um, Tom Jones, he is a PhD student here at the University of Queensland, who's working in the field of geomicrobiology. He has a background in exploration geology and seismic surveying, and his current research looks at how microbes can be used throughout the mining and remediation processes around the world. And finally, um, Jordan, a second year PhD candidate here at UQ as well. Uh, he's advised by um, Professor Gordon Southern, um, also working in the geomicrobiology field. He completed his BSc honours in geography at the University of Winnipeg, and an MSc in Earth Sciences at the University of Toronto. Uh, so today's talk is very topical. Um, it's going to be investigating the role of microbial processes in carbon storage and kimberlite rocks and tailings. Um, it's going to be a tag team, so we're going to start with Evelyn and then we're going to pass down the chain as well. Um, just before we do start, we obviously will take questions in the room, but for those online, if you can type questions in the Q&A box in Zoom, that'd be great. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan, and thanks very much for the invitation to present today. As Nathan said, today we're going to be discussing carbon storage in kimberlite rocks and tailings. Kimberlite, in case anyone doesn't know, is the rock that is mined for diamonds and found at diamond mines around the world. And this is a big topic. There's a lot of ongoing research within De Beers and other places looking at carbon storage and tailings. What we want to focus on today is looking at the role of microbes in some of these carbonation reactions. The presentation is going to be by myself, and then I'll hand over to Jordan, and finally I'll hand over to Tom. We'd like to acknowledge funding from De Beers Group and also from NSERC in Canada. Today, I'm going to start with a bit of a general overview of carbon storage and mine tailings, and I'm also going to give a high-level summary of Project Carbon Vault, which is a De Beers research and development initiative looking at the potential to store carbon at its diamond mine sites. Jordan is going to be talking about the role of microbes in natural weathering of kimberlite rocks, which is something that we need to understand in order to know how we can accelerate reactions and tailings. And then Tom is going to be talking about some collaborative experimental work between De Beers Group and the University of Queensland's both lab scale and larger field scale experiments that are looking at the potential to use biofilms to increase carbon storage rates in kimberlite tailings. To start, I thought it would be useful to go through some carbon storage terminology. For those who don't work in the field, the terminology can be a little bit confusing. There's different terms that are used in the scientific literature and also in the media. I always like to start with thinking about carbon storage as a natural process. It's something that happens all the time as part of the carbon cycle. So you can think about having different spheres or sometimes you might hear the word reservoir in the earth. You can have carbon in the atmosphere, in the air which is where we're having a problem. We have too much anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere. It's leading to climate change issues. You can also have carbon going into the biosphere and then circulating into the lithosphere, into the Earth's crust, and into the hydrosphere, such as the ocean. So first and foremost, I like to think of it as a natural process. However, when you hear the term carbon storage, a lot of the time that's referring to enhanced or geoengineered carbon storage. And the goal of that is to specifically take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and lock it away into a different reservoir, often the lithosphere or the Earth's crust, with the goal of mitigating the emissions that are coming from humans. Two types of carbon storage are talked about quite a lot in the geoengineering space. Both of them are targeting storage in the lithosphere. So you may hear the term geological storage, and you may also hear the term mineral carbonation or carbon mineralization. So this can be a bit confusing because mineral carbonation is technically a type of geological storage. But generally when the term geological storage is used, this is referring to storage of the CO2 as a fluid underground in a sedimentary basin, in an old oil reservoir or a non-economic coal bed, storing it underground. Um, as you see in this image here, where you have CO2 here 
there's some kind of cap or seal on the top, which is hopefully going to prevent um, the leakage of CO2 coming back up and potentially getting into places where you don't want it, such as an aquifer. However, you do with this traditional geological storage, because it's a fluid and you're dependent upon that seal, you do have to have monitoring and this is always going to be a concern. Mineral carbonation is a specific type of geological storage. And what that's referring to specifically is rather than storing CO2 as a fluid, you're actually converting that CO2 to a solid carbonate mineral, which is safe and non-toxic. You're usually forming these in mafic or ultramafic rocks because those are the rocks in which carbonate alteration minerals form the most quickly in nature. And so that's generally what's targeted. And the big advantage of this is that you don't have to monitor it. That carbon is locked away for a very long time and stored as that, as that solid mineral. So that's one reason why mineral carbonation is exciting. So that will hopefully help you with, with some of this terminology. Um, it can, can get a bit confusing. Another good slide to put up, which puts mineral carbonation in perspective in the carbon storage landscape is this fantastic figure. Maybe some of you have seen it before. This was published quite a few years ago, 2003 by Klaus Lackner. And I really, really like it. So what we have on this figure is we have a whole bunch of different spheres or reservoirs where you could potentially store carbon or where carbon is already stored on the earth. And on the one axis, you have the characteristic storage time. So when carbon is put into that reservoir, how long is it going to stay in that reservoir before it's going to cycle out into another reservoir, getting back into, into something else and eventually getting back into the atmosphere? And then on this axis, you've got the total carbon storage capacity in gigatons. And you can see that it's going up uh, quite quickly here. So what we have on this diagram, as you can see, we've got the biosphere, for example. We've got things like leaf litter, woody biomass, soil carbon. You also have the hydrosphere, you've got the ocean acidic and then the ocean neutral. You've got enhanced oil recovery, underground injection. So that would be that traditional geological storage field. And then all the way at the top, you have this field called mineral carbonates. So mineral carbonates have the longest characteristic storage time. If you put carbon in there, it's gonna stay for the longest of any of the reservoirs. And they also have the, by far the largest storage capacity. You can store many, 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 many gigatons of carbon in them. The challenge is how do we form mineral carbonates fast enough and economically enough that we can untap that storage reservoir? And that has historically been the challenge. If we can unlock that, it's long been considered the holy grail of carbon storage. It's a really, really good option for storing carbon from a, a safety and, and time point of view. Mineral carbonation, what we're talking about today is really just one technology in a family of mineral carbonation technologies that different people around the globe are researching. It's a very, very active and exciting field at the moment. I've put up a great diagram here from a report that came out in December last year from the Energy Futures Initiative, where they actually um, had a workshop that I participated in. They had experts from all over the globe come together and they reviewed the state of mineral carbonation technologies, including the technology readiness level and other factors, limitations. And this is a summary diagram looking at this. So to briefly put mine tailings in perspective within this bigger family of technologies, it's worth noting that most mineral carbonation technologies, as I mentioned previously, are targeting formation of these carbonate minerals in ultramafic and sometimes also in mafic rocks, such as basalts. And again, that's because in nature, that's where these minerals form the most quickly, the most easily, these rocks weather the most easily. So if you want to speed something up, it's good to start with something that's already got a um, good thermodynamic drive. In this diagram, you can think about um, two general approaches for mineral carbonation. So you can think about ex situ, where you would mine mafic to ultramafic rocks and minerals and take them to mineral carbonation plants where you would react them at high temperatures and pressures. That um, is something that there's a lot of research in and, and carries on to this day, but obviously that is expensive and it has an energy penalty, both from the transport of the material and from running that plant. Another option for mineral carbonation is to do it in situ or in a superficial environment where rather than transporting the material somewhere, you try and form the carbonates in situ in um, bedrock or at mine sites, you have the option to do this in tailings, which is exciting because of that increased surface area. So you can see some of those in this diagram. You can see the, the in situ ones here, the offshore and onshore basalts and also in prototype, which is an ultramafic rock. 
And then you've also got some of these um, exit you ones and mine tailings are sitting here. There's some newer things that people are um, talking about these days like magnesium looping. I won't go into that one, but it's just worth noting that there's quite a few different things to look at in this space, including adding to, to farm soil, that sort of thing. The other thing that's important to note is that the source of the CO2 can be different things. A lot of mineral carbonation technologies are actually doing direct air capture, which is exciting because that is a difficult thing to do at low cost. So mine tailing, some of the options, including the ones we're talking about today, you don't need to concentrate the CO2, you're actually drawing it down from the atmosphere, which is important. You can also, of course, use more concentrated sources of CO2, like point source capture from the power plants. And you can also pair it with things like um, some of the direct air capture technologies that are being produced by companies like Climeworks. So you can use carbon from a variety of sources with these technologies. What you do need to do, and I did some calculations a few years ago as part of my PhD, you can't just um, have ultramafic rocks take up this carbon at their natural rates. It's far too slow to offset emissions. So you need to do something to speed these rates up. And this is very simplified, but just to go through generically what options you have to speed this up, you can increase surface area, you can break up the rocks. So that's what happens already with mine tailings. You've got that increased surface area, so you already have an enhancement over natural rates in bedrock. You can add heat or increase pressure, which is typically what's done in those mineral carbonation plants, the ex situ approach. You can add CO2, um, either get more atmospheric CO2 flowing through the system or use a concentrated CO2 source. You can add chemicals to help dissolve the minerals to release cations for the process. And finally, you can add microbes, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Now let's talk about carbon storage at mine sites. So ultramafic rocks, which are the rocks in which these carbonate alteration minerals form the most quickly, are not that common on Earth's surface. They probably cover about 1% of Earth's surface. So there's plenty of them, but you know, they're not abundant everywhere. However, at mine sites, they can be very common because of course, what is a mine? It's something in a rock that's less common that has something valuable in it. So ultramafic rocks are mined for diamonds, which is a luxury good, and also for a number of commodities, such as uh, platinum group metals, nickel, sometimes copper, chromite, historically also asbestos mining. And as I mentioned, the breakup of ultramafic rock really increases the surface area and already is enhancing these reactions. So in the figure here, I have some images from some mines. There's an abandoned asbestos mine in Canada. There's a diamond mine in Canada and Mount Keith Nickel mine, which is here in Australia. And you can actually see in the tailings unintentionally, this is not something that was geoengineered. You can actually see and measure, there's been scientific papers, carbonate minerals forming very rapidly in these tailings on the time scales of mining. The most extraordinary example is Mount Keith where there was a study that showed that the unintentional carbon storage in mine tailings was actually offsetting 11% of the mine's emissions. And there was a great study by Sasha Wilson that was published on that in 2014. So even without geoengineering, that increased surface area is leading to increases in these reactions. And the thought with the research that De Beers and other people are doing is that if you could modify your tailings management or implement some kinds of technologies, you could increase that carbon storage even more. And at many ultramafic mine sites, depending on what level of technology and cost you're willing to put into it, you have the potential to offset all of your emissions or even more. But you need to do something to bring those, those rates up because 11% uh, is mouth key, but most, most mines that unintentional carbon storage is, is much, much less than, than that in terms of offsetting mine emissions. So when researchers are looking at carbon storage and mine tailings, they like to put up this triangle. It's a useful way to think about what might be limiting the reactions. So you need mineral dissolution to supply cations such as calcium and magnesium. They need to be able to react with a source of carbon dioxide. And then ultimately they need to precipitate carbonate minerals. And any one of the three parts of this triangle can potentially be rate limiting. The studies that have been done in ultramafic mine tailings have generally shown that what's limiting to start the reactions is generally CO2 supply. There's just not enough CO2 getting into those tailings. So that's usually the first hurdle that you want to tackle in terms of increasing these rates. Once you are able to supply enough CO2, the next rate limiting part tends to be mineral dissolution and that supply of cations. And then the last step that generally is limiting is carbonate precipitation. 
What is exciting about microbes, and Tom and Jordan will talk more about this, is that they can potentially help speed up all three parts of this triangle. Now I'm going to give a brief overview, just two slides, about De Beers Project Carbon Vault. But if anybody has more questions about that, I'd be happy to chat afterwards or to take some questions online. So Carbon Vault is a project that was publicly announced by De Beers in 2017, but actually started in early 2016 as a small desktop study. There were not very many of us working on it, um, but has since grown to quite a big project where we are working on De Beers mine sites in three countries, in Canada, South Africa, and Botswana. And we've progressed from desktop work in 2016 to field scale trials, which are currently ongoing in Canada and South Africa. We are working in collaboration, um, an in-house team of researchers um, working in collaboration with academics, both in Australia and Canada, including uh, Gordon Southam's group at the University of Queensland, who's leading the, the microbial work. How might we achieve carbon storage through mineral carbonation in a diamond mine. There's a paper that I'd be happy to circulate afterwards where we looked at the potential and the possible pathways at mine sites in Canada and South Africa published in 2018 by myself and a number of the researchers. And as part of that paper, we put together this figure just to think about what the steps would be in terms of implementing this at a mine site. So the first thing you need to do is know what your CO2 emissions are. And these are gonna be your scope one and scope two emissions from your on-site power generation and your mine trucks, and also from any electricity that you might be buying. So you need to know what that is. And then you need to set an emissions offset target, something that you believe is gonna be achievable through mineral carbonation at whatever price point you are willing to pay for that. The next thing that's really important to do is you need to understand what carbonation reactions and what unintentional carbon storage is already happening in your mine tailings. And that is something that um, getting a baseline study actually is, is not trivial. It does take a lot of work. And it's also really important to know if you want to um, do carbon accounting and potentially get carbon credits for this at a later stage. It's also really important because understanding what's going on already will help you understand what's rate limiting, what part of that triangle do you need to be targeting and how might you do that. The next thing you need to do is implement some kind of technologies. And De Beers is currently looking at four technologies, general technology categories. One is something that's just called enhanced passive carbonation. And that is really looking at things where you make some simple changes to how you physically manage the tailings. So you might turn over the tailings, you might rotate your tailings deposition points more often so that you've got thinner layers of tailings, simple interventions that aren't gonna get you a lot of carbonation, but might cost you nothing or very little and could very well get you something substantial in terms of offsets or something, something worthwhile. The next technology that we're looking at is adding chemicals to the tailings, not harmful chemicals, but um, things that are sort of in the field of your normal processing. And that is to help with the mineral dissolution to release cations, particularly from minerals such as serpentine and clays that have a lot of cations, but will be slow to release those. Obviously, if you have some other minerals like brucite, for example, that react really quickly, that's not needed. But at a lot of ultramorphic mine sites, um, you, you have a lot of capacity, storage capacity in those minerals that are harder to get the cations out of. So we've got research um, in that field. Then we have some studies, particularly in Canada, at our mine Gauchakwe, where we have diesel generation. Uh, we have on-site source of flue gas, looking at CO2 injection into mine tailings. And then the last general field of research, which we'll talk about today, is microbes. After you identify technology and you implement it, the next thing you need to do is monitor the amount of carbon that's stored over time. Even if you're not getting a carbon credit for it, it's just voluntary or it's reputational benefit, you still need to prove to somebody what carbon is going in there and, and track that so that you can achieve that offset that you want. And then at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you can still rehabilitate the tailings and not have any environmental issues. So because the carbonation reactions occur quickly and they don't seem to have any negative impacts in the studies we've done in terms of rehabilitation, the idea is that once the mine closes, or once you're done using that tailings facility for carbon storage, you would cover the tailings over as normal and rehabilitate them as normal with vegetation. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Jordan, who's going to talk about natural kimberlite weathering and tell you about what yellow ground is. We'll just quickly swap over the microphone. Thanks. 
All right, so Evelyn already explained uh, why kimberlite is important. It's important because it, it has diamonds, but it's also important because it's, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> it, it achieves those, those three points that Evelyn was talking about naturally um, and really quickly. So kimberlite comes up from below the earth, uh, creates this, this nice little carrot um, in the ground, and you have what, uh, and you have weathering occurring at the, the very top. Uh, and if we just leave it alone, do nothing to it, don't take out the diamonds, just leave the rock where it is. Um, you have, have this cap rock, which is called yellow ground in South Africa. Um, or that's, I guess, where the term came from. Uh, and then the stuff that's unweathered below is called blue ground. It's quite hard. It's, it's a volcanic rock. Um, and so they're the same rock, but they're dramatically different. The yellow ground is it's crumbly. It's, it's yellow. Um, some of them look a lot like uh, a limestone. And I'm from Manitoba, where there's limestone everywhere. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh, that's that's not a volcanic rock, but it is. Um, and so they're, they were the same, but now they're different. Um, so we have two hand samples here. On the bottom left is a, a yellow ground hand sample, and on the bottom right is the blue ground ha hand sample. They're the same, they're the same, but they're different. <laughs> uh, above, the, the hand samples are um, some light microscopy, uh, B and E, those are plane polars. Uh, on the left is the yellow ground, on the right is the blue ground. And then we have some XFM images uh, from the Australian synchrotron, C and F. So C is the yellow ground and F is the blue ground. Here, green is calcium, red is iron, and blue is potassium. And again, see this massive, massive difference. Um, so generally, what is accepted with kimberlite, uh, kimberlite, what's going on is that there's this uh, serpentinization of the olivines and uh, clay formation, and that is creating all of that space, that expansion and contraction to give us that yellow ground. Um, but also, something that hasn't really been looked at is the microbes because it seems to me that something's missing from the puzzle. How do we get this dramatically altering um, rock near the surface, yet as we go deeper and deeper, it's, um, it's, it's less weathered. So I have a whole bunch of kimberlite samples, um, and I do some 16S amplification and uh, sequencing. I just take the rock, crush it up, and uh, sequence to see what sort of uh, microbes appear. <laughs> so on, on this chart on the left, we have uh, yellow ground on the, the furthest left of these 10 samples. And then as we move right, the, the samples are less and less weathered. Um, and we can see that they have some sort of microbial community. Mostly they're acidobacteria, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, some of them have cyanobacteria. Tom's gonna to talk a little bit about cyanobacteria, but I'm not too concerned about that because I wanna know how the rock is broken down. Um, and this, this sequencing of rocks, our sequencing of the, the microbial communities in rocks is kind of a, a new development. So it's not unique that they have these um, run-of-the-mill soil uh, bacteria. So on the left from Kilias et al, they looked at uh, serpentine, yeah, some serpentinized olivine, and they see the same sort of uh, microbial communities, acidobacteria, actinobacteria, proteobacteria. And they also compared their samples to uh, some serpentinizing environments that are currently serpentinizing. These are um, aquifers and uh, both hot and cold. 
uh, and we see more proteobacteria in those. And then on the right, this is from Bioluceal 2018. This is from the Krafla lava, lava flow in Iceland. So it's not an ultramafic rock, but it's just a basalt. But still here we have bacteria. And it's doing something to the rock. Although for Krafla, it's occurring much, much slower. So I know that there's bacteria in my samples. But how do, I, how do I get them to do something? Well, I just put some blue ground and some yellow ground in a beaker, added some water, and let them do their thing for a bit. It felt like a child <laughs> playing in a playground. Um, but it did something. Um, these bacteria grew. I used uh, light microscopy to, to see whether or not they're doing anything. And they were. Um, so. I wanted to see what they look like. Uh, well, so I took a, a thin section of the blue ground, added my inoculation of the, the yellow ground and blue ground mixture, uh, let them sit for three months, and I got this. Um, so we have some what might be colobacter on the left, and then a whole bunch of biofilm on the right. So with just water and blue ground as their food, they are, they're doing their thing. <laughs> um, here's a, a few more images close up. So we have all this biofilm and ex uh, extracellular polymer substance all over the place. Like it's super easy to find. Um, yeah, it's everywhere. But I need to prove that we need, or I don't need to prove, I want to find out whether or not, <laughs> whether or not the bacteria are actually contributing to this, um, to the weathering. So I set up another experiment uh, where I have a bunch of blue ground in a, in a tube, and I'm circulating water through it that had been inoculated with that, uh, with those communities that I made with the, the yellow ground and blue ground. Um, and that's running constantly. It's going to be running for the next year, maybe two years. Depends how the PhD goes, right? Um, so they're going to be doing that 10 milliliters every hour just to, I guess, replicate the, the, Vados, the Vados zone. That is below the yellow ground, that stuff that's already been weathered, and above the water table. Uh, and then I also have this control, a gamma irradiated the, the blue ground on the left side uh, to get rid of all of those microbes. And then I'm also using 100 ppm sodium azide to keep them under control so that they don't pop up. And so I'm taking one of these columns down every three months um, or nine months, 15 months. Again, it depends how the PhD goes. Um, and I can do 16S on these uh, as well as some SEM, some XRF some XRD, and then on the water, I'm doing hydrogeochemistry to, to see whether or not uh, what elements are coming into solution and to tell me whether or not these things are actually weathering. So I took down one of these columns. I actually took down two of the columns because I made a mistake, but I took down one um, and kind of got the same sort of thing going on. There's colobacter everywhere. A lot of, um, it's not as nice as the thin section one, but there is a lot of action going on in the, uh, in the biological column. Um, and the hydrogeochemistry tells me that they are weathering. They are pulling those elements out of the, uh, out of the rock and putting them into solution. And right, so, but what's confusing about this is that we're not really sure what it is they're eating. They need a source of energy. They need uh, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus. Yeah, that's, that's enough. Anyways, I'm not too sure about the carbon. I know that there's organic carbon inside the kimberlite material, but I don't know what it is. So that's one of the questions I have in order to uh, figure out what it is they're eating so that we can test this and see what sort of um, 
what sort of organic carbon we can give them to speed up this dissolution process uh, that they're taking care of. Uh, here's another 16S chart. You'll notice that, so CA is the abiotic columns and CB is the biological columns. So there's still stuff in the CA. Well, that's because just because you kill them doesn't mean they're going to not show up um, in, the, in the family tree. Um, but we noticed some, some things about the, the biological columns. There's this pr sort of stable proteobacteria signal. And those are those, those colobacters that, that we saw in the, in the SEM image. And um, yeah, what else? It's, it seems more diverse. I'm not sure what else to say about this. Um, right, so I'm not done yet. I, I still have a, a year to go with this. And so as we, as we learn more, we can, we can figure out more about what's going on with uh, the microbes instead of just relying on the, the clay expansion to, to say that that's how yellow ground is formed. So with that, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so all this foundational work that Jordan's doing on this rock is essential for this project. And I really use it to guide the direction that I take for my research, which is, which is experimentation and having a look at what's already in the natural environments that we're working in and trying to make a link between the micro that we're playing in and the macro that is the minds that we're gonna place this technology into. So we've seen the transition of blue ground to yellow ground. This is what we're trying to achieve. It's already happening. We're just trying to accelerate it. But this is a rock that's, that this is happening in. And we're not really sure what's going on in CRDs, in the coarse deposits that we're gonna be implementing this technology into. So, that's what we did at the start of this project. We, we had access to a, to a range of mines in Southern Africa where we were able to go and have a look at what was happening in the CRD. C, CRD is the coarse deposit and as opposed to the FRD, which is the fine uh, residue deposit. And that pivots around 800 micron grain size. And what we found is that in this once loose material that was coming out of these mines, very quickly on a decadal scale, it was uh, achieving some level of consolidation. So we found, we found all this stuff. We brought it back to UQ and we embedded it and we had a look at it. And we actually found that this consolidation was due to this secondary calcium mineral that was encompassing 90% of the grains. It was overwhelming how, uh, how widespread this material was. And that was really exciting. Uh, but it kind of got us thinking about what, what this material actually is and how it comes to be in this sample. So we used some SEM EDS. We found that it's actually primarily a calcium magnesium carbonate. And within that, you know, we're talking about CRD, which is a kimberlite weathering at sufficient conditions. So we're kind of working within this soil context. You know, soil is just a rock plus bacteria, time and water. So we kind of delved into it a little bit, having a look at the 16S as John has already gone on about. And we found that it has a really diverse microbiome. It has the stuff that you would expect at surface conditions, the heterotrophs, phototrophs, biofilm producers and plant symbiotes. But it also had some stuff that we weren't quite expecting, it, anaerobic fermentators and iron reducing bacteria. So we have this whole cycle, this whole redox cycle going on, oxidation reduction in a really small environment. And this was really exciting because as we know, different metabolisms utilize different metabolic mechanisms to live. And we can utilize all of those different metabolisms 
in a certain way to help sequester CO2. Of course, the superstar of this process is photosynthesis, which is, also, it, which is very efficient at creating carbonate, but we also use it as our CO2 conduit drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere and into uh, our material. But then once it's underground, there's a wide array of different metabolisms that can be used to help lock this away. So this is what I've tried to achieve in, uh, tried to replicate in the lab. So this is the Venetia mine in South Africa, and this is our main field site. You can see the scale of it. So when we were thinking about how to replicate in the lab, we had to draw it back to basics. We think about CRD in two main ways, a depositional phase or an inoculation phase for biologists, and then a burial phase. So we can play with the inoculation phase material, but once it's buried, it's kind of hands off. So we were thinking about how to, how to inoculate the material with the bugs. We went to Venetia and we collected biofilms from the pit as well as the CRD material and we brought it back. And we ran a whole range of different studies on this scale, about 50 grams, mixing it in, superficial uh, deposition, super gene uh, in the inoculation phase. And then once it was in the burial phase, was it better to try and dry it out or keep it, uh, keep it saturated? And we found that essentially, if you add microbes to this material, you're gonna increase carbonate. But if you can mix it in, and then once it's buried, keep it saturated, we're gonna accelerate that carbonate precipitation. This is, a, this is a photo of, or an SEM of what these bugs look like in this environment. And uh, in this synchrotron image, you can see how widespread the biofilm is throughout the sample. And it's amazing, we can just use calcium to track where the biofilm is, where the white arrows are showing. So you can see the power that it has over the microenvironment, drawing in these micronutrients together, bringing, this, bringing all this chemistry in together. And we find that wherever there is calcium carbonate precipitating, we see all these little entombed fossils of bacteria. So mix, bacteria and rocks together, we're gonna to be producing secondary carbonate. And we know that it's biogenic because there's bacteria within it. So that's all very exciting. And all of this stuff that we, all of these methods that we figured out in this lab scale study, we then used on a pilot, on a field trial study that uh, we started at the end of 2019. These are some photos we went to, uh, this is currently set up in DevTech and De Beers offices in Johannesburg. So we went to uh, Venetia and collected a lot of bacteria and we grew it up in about 10,000 litres worth of media to get our numbers. And then we, then at the start of 2020, we started the experiment. So we worked through the burial phase, uh, we worked through the inoculation phase of these CRD experiments, mixing all this material together. And then we've left it in its burial phase. So you can see here, we have the CRD bio and control. We also have the FRD bio and control uh, going on in the background. And so these are, just, these are some images of the FRD drying out over the first six months. You can see that it, essentially it's coated in secondary precipitates everywhere with these drying cracks, increasing the surface area, a lot of geochemistry going on. And these are some photos of, well, some current photos of the CRD control and the CRD bio after one year. And there's no difference between this material apart from the bacteria. So when we're talking about, you know, post remediation, uh, post carbonation remediation, we can see that we're really accelerating the, this, this move into a soil area with this, uh, with the addition of this bacteria. Something really interesting about this is that essentially after one year, we're producing a very, very similar microbiome that we found in those early CRD uh, samples that we collected from the mine. So that's, uh, that's very promising. And water chemistry is showing that we have a lot of nutrient cycling going on also. So hopefully this, this uh, has probably got about a month left over there before we get the samples and then we'll be able to wrap that up and uh, see what really happened. And I think that's it. Thank you.
thanks very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for your, your interesting talk. I think that was a really uh, a fascinating oversight of the work that is continuing to go on through your research as well. Um, now we're going to invite questions from the floor. I'm going to run around with the microphone here. Um, the guys at the front will pass the microphone together, and Rick will handle any questions from anybody online. So. Um, for those of you online, just to remind you, if you can, just quest, put the questions in the question and answer box and Rick can pick up from there. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? Hi, it's uh, Tim Napierman for those who are online. Thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I, I just have a, a question uh, I know, and you may know about this, so forgive me if you do. Uh, some work was done, I think, back in about 2007, the PhD program in the University of Pretoria that looked at accelerated weathering of kimberlite by adding certain cations, which were shown to accelerate that process considerably. I just wondered if that's something you've looked at as a sort of add-on to the to the microbe attack. Yes, we are. We are aware of that work. Um, I think we have access to those reports through DevTech, and I think they've been looking at that more with the cation study than with the microbe study. I don't know if that's something that you've been looking at, Tom. Uh, yeah, that a lot of that stuff has been going on with the cation study. I mean, that 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 world is very important to what we're doing, but we're trying to keep it uh, for this. Trying to keep it basically internal within the Kimberlite, what already exists there without any additions. So that's kind of what you're doing to add. Yeah. Right, yeah, I'm very familiar with uh, Morkel, Morkel's work. Um, so I, I did a number of things in the lab using uh, copper sulfate. Um, and I forget, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, these, large um these large uh anions really pull apart the smectite clays and create that extra surface area um but again that's not really something that we're we were with yeah we, we definitely are looking at those old studies and the focus of those was more on processing because in the early days yellow ground was so easy to process and mine and actually a lot of the early diamond mines in south africa as some of you might know stopped production once they got down to the blue ground because there wasn't cost effective technology to process the kimberlite so it would be fantastic if you could weather the kimberlite make it easier to mine and store carbon at the same time that would be great um, but our, our studies have, have spun that around a little bit and are, are looking at ways to just just produce the carbon in the tailings but yes we are aware of those studies and have taken a look so thank you can i just do a quick follow-up question um so uh from what you've learned um from both the literature and your own experiments do, do you have a call on what the dominant mechanism was for the original geological weathering that created the blue, the, the yellow ground from the blue ground well, did microbes play a significant role in that geological process that's a really good question and i'll make a general comment that despite yellow ground being really important for early diamond mining particularly in southern africa it's something that has not received much scientific study at all there's a handful of papers written on it and one reason for that is that a lot of the diamond mines that have been the focus of a lot of studies the yellow ground was mined out in the 1800s and it's actually difficult to get good samples we struggled we had to really hunt around kimberley to get good original yellow grounds um, some of the newer mines you can sometimes find it in some of the early exploration core of course you could go to kimberlites that don't have diamonds but those tend to be a bit harder to to access for study so it's something that i think just the fundamental chemistry and mineralogy changes have not been very well studied um, i think there was there hasn't been much realization about how much carbonate is actually in them. People tended to think that they were mostly clays and things, and we're finding that there's a lot of carbonate in them. And certainly what Jordan's doing, I'll hand over to him, is indicating that, you know, uh, I think historically it's been thought it's mostly just groundwater processes that are that are handling that, but we think the microbes certainly are, are playing a role in that, and that's the focus of Jordan's PhD, so. Right, yeah, so you have the, the serpentinization that's going on. So we could look at the entire process without microbes or any life at all. And it would, maybe it would still happen. Um, but with the serpentinization, you're providing, um, you're providing energy for, for life to produce and work on the material. Um, and that is it's kind of what we're seeing in, in the columns. Um, the, the rock is being broken down perhaps just by simple rock water interaction. And then the microbes are 
uh, employing what's going on there. We could discuss what this, uh, what influence this all has on life on Mars, but that might, that's for another discussion. Let's, um, let's take that up over tea. How about we do that? Rick, do you want to look at that? Um, yes, yeah, so there's one online here from an anonymous attendee. Is the organic carbon content of blue ground comparable to the total carbon content of the blue ground? I guess the associated question with that is how much, what's the carbon content of the blue ground? Uh, so it's like 3% three, 3 uh, total carbon and like 2.5% organic carbon. Um, I'm thinking that they're hydrocarbons but I don't really have anything to back that up at this point. And it's worth noting that that's on samples from some mines, how variable that is in different environments. I'm not sure. I mean, um, Jordan's been focusing on Kimberlites from Southern Africa in a particular climate regime. Um, yeah, we'll need to think about how variable that is in different Kimberlites based on their composition and maybe any environmental factors that could be affecting carbon. Great talk, really enjoy that. So thank you for that. Um, I've probably got two questions. And um, first is just a general one. Um, obviously, you're talking a lot about diamond mining kimberlites today. Um, but in terms of other ore deposit styles where mineral carbonation is viable, do you want to just, um, just have give a brief comment on that? Sure. So there has been quite a bit of work done, mostly sort of academic university studies, looking at asbestos mines, including here in Australia, and also nickel mines. There was that comprehensive study that was done at Mount Keith. What's exciting about Project Carbon Vault is that it's the first project that was really driven from industry. So really getting strong industry report because um, these studies, I think mine tailings work has been done for about the last 15 years, mostly by um, Greg Dipple's group in Canada. And there's um, also some researchers, Sasha Wilson, who used to be in Melbourne, Ian Power, uh, Gordon Southern, obviously. And there's, there's some other researchers as well in that field. And they've looked, um, looked at quite a few mine sites. And every single ultramific mine site, whether it's been an academic study done to date, has found some level of mineral carbonation occurring in the tailings. Something just in general that is really important for getting that mineral carbonation to happen really quickly is the presence of brucite, which reacts particularly quickly. So Mount Keith has a lot of brucite, which is part of the reason why you get so much of that unintentional carbon storage. At other sites, kimberlites, um, they tend to have a lot less brucite where we've studied them. And so that's why you need to think about some of these, these other acceleration technologies. But I think industry should, should do more. We should, we should evaluate this. And even if you don't want to implement really high levels of technologies or expensive technologies yet, if there's some simple things you can do to your tailings management that can increase carbon storage, that's really good. The other potential benefit for industry, we didn't talk about that in this talk today. We could probably talk all day about this, but as some of you may have figured out, um, cementation of tailings is advantageous from a safety point of view. You also tend to you know, reduce dust. And so there's environmental co-benefits. Um, sometimes you can get metals being taken up in the carbonates. And so actually looking at carbon storage being combined with other benefits that you'd like to have is something that I think mining companies need to consider. Because if you can think about the economics of not just the carbon storage, but of those other benefits, particularly tailing safety, then some of these more expensive technologies may make sense to implement. So I think, I think it needs to be looked at holistically. And I think there's a big need, and I'd say to anybody in the mining industry who's, who's listening into this talk, really consider looking into this and giving it some support because the academic scientists need access to mine sites. They need access to the sort of engineering support that big mining companies can provide. And we need many companies to um, be doing this. De Beers is obviously got some of its own IP, but we're generally sharing and allowing the academics to publish this work because for us, we see that it's beneficial for us if the whole mining industry transforms. And so we don't want to hold this too close. Um, we're very happy to have some discussions with other companies if they're interested. That's great. I guess, the, sorry, the second part of my question was just around carbon budgeting and thinking about different um, 
I guess, impacts of different waste streams. So I guess in acid one drainage, you know, the holy grail for us is always to find carbonates and sort of commingle them with acid forming materials. So in terms of like looking at sources and sinks of, of carbon sort of around mine waste, is that also something that has been sort of factored into the carbon vault sort of thought process? Yeah, not it, necessarily, is, it is really important. I mean, yeah. kimberlites, of course, are ultramafic, so yeah, they so don't tend to have the same acid yeah. mine drainage mm -hmm. problems all the time, although it depends on the country rock and how much of that is getting into your waste streams. So I wouldn't say that it's it's, you know, never a potential problem, but that is something that I think, in particular, um, Sasha Wilson, who's leading that cation exchange work, is looking at very carefully because we need to ensure that any any sort of reactions that we're changing in the tailings are not going to compromise the water quality. Ideally, they would improve it. Okay. Um, awesome. I got very concerned about what these little things are eating. And could you say a bit more about that? Yes. Uh, I just, uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're eating. <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, but, but generally, they need a source of energy. Um, and that source of energy could be in the form of hydrogen. It could be in the form of sunlight. I think for Tom's case, that's more uh, relevant. But me, I'm focusing on the subsurface. So they have to be getting uh, carbon likely organic carbon from old, dead, infiltrated uh, beings. <laughs> um, but yeah, the school's out for, for what they're eating. It's a cool mystery. Yes. I think for, yeah, in my world, photosynthetic microbes, which take up the, the bulk of the microbes in the community, they're kind of the primary producers of the environment. A lot of the heterotrophs will be consuming those to a certain extent and we also have chemolithotrophs so things that are actually breaking down eating the rock and then once you get into the, the fermentation side of stuff that is yeah so basically i think that most of most of the carbon that has been taken up further down the chain will be coming from those primary photosynthetic bacteria that are then moved down further in the uh, in the chain so is the goal at its core to get those photosynthetic bacteria to photosynthesize faster than they would if we just left them alone in the middle of a desert? They, happy bugs will, will photosynthesize as quick as they can. So the, the aim is to make sure that they're as happy as possible on the surface. So once they get buried, we can't really, we can't really influence what, what they're up to, but on the surface, getting that biomass on the surface, we want them as happy as possible. And then once they go down and back into the food chain with the other microbes, that's where the other metabolisms can kind of take over and use that carbon down there. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Steve. Thanks. Hi, Evelyn. I'm going to do the dangerous thing of having walked in at the end of the talk and not listen to everyone what you said. So maybe this question's already answered. But um, the by far one of the biggest waste rocks around the world is actually mafic, you know, basalt. And we know from um, studies of things like river chemistry that there's a significant CO2 drawdown through weathering of basalts globally, particularly in places like Indonesia, but it's slow. So um, what potential looking into the future do we have for carbonation of mineral basalt waste rocks? It's a really good question. And I think there haven't been, to my knowledge, too many studies looking at tailings of purely mafic rocks. I mean, you do tend to get, um, there's been a little bit of work done in the Bushfeld and the platinum mines, and they have a lot more pyroxene and sort of more mafic than ultramafic compositions. But um, the study that I would point to, to look at that is there's something, I'm not sure if you've heard of, there's something called the Carbfix project in Iceland, which is one of those in situ projects where they've been putting CO2 underground into basaltic rocks. And before they published their big study a couple of years ago, which I believe came out in science, there were many skeptics who looked at theoretical rates of basalts dissolution and alteration and said, there's no way this is going to work. There's no way you're going to form carbonates because it's going to take thousands to millions of years. And then they did their pilot injection of carbon dioxide and they found that 95% of the CO2 was reacting with that Icelandic basalts in less than two years. 
And so that's led to a really revision in thinking about, okay, well, you have these theoretical or these laboratory things, but what else is going on in the environment that's influencing that? And so I think basalt has a lot more potential than, than people think. And I think the microbe story is really important to think about there, and there probably needs to be some more research done there. But I guess ultramafic mine tailings are the low-hanging fruit. We know that they're reacting. We know, especially when they have brucite, we should look at that. And then the next thing maybe to consider is what you can do with basalt or what you can do with um, other waste rock as well. Um, I think we need to be not competing in this space. We need as much carbon storage as possible. So I, I think it's worth um, some more research starting up with more mafic mine tailings. I have my own questions. It's really unfair to have to read the online questions as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll be, be, be fair to the online people. Um, and, um, and there's one question here um, asking basically, do you know how fast the microbial enhanced carbonation is going on compared to in situ weathering? I guess it's not entirely unrelated to your question just, or your answer just then, but yeah, the, the relative speeds of, of just natural weathering versus, versus microbial enhanced. I guess that's the point of the experimental work. I don't know if we've got a rate yet. Tom, if you can answer that. Uh, currently in our ongoing experiments, we haven't, we haven't done any rate work yet, but in our, in our uh, lab scale experiments, over a year we were increasing, we were increasing the carbonate in the material by on a percent scale. So we have to, we'll have to, Back calculate and do some rate work, but we're we're looking at that on the pilots, but we haven't on the field trials. You're still, you're still waiting. They're still waiting for the final samples from South Africa. So that is we don't know, and that's part of the point of the work. And it's obviously something that would probably vary based on the kimberlite composition and, and other factors. But it's more, and yeah. hopefully a lot more. We'll we'll see soon. Okay, now I'm going to ask my question. Well, I had a whole bunch really because it's such an exciting talk, but the. Um, um, the, the comparative images, the synchrotron images of the blue rock and the yellow rock, one of the things that stood out the most was the, was the um, you know, the, the, you mentioned, I think that the green was calcium, the enormous amount of calcium in the yellow rock. Were, and, and it made me think, has anybody done the mass balance to see, is that a, like a residual effect or are you adding calcium? Has anybody actually, you know, done the, the taken, okay, here's the, here's the blue equivalent of the yellow and, and said, okay, which, which ones are, which elements are, are leaving and which elements are coming in? That's, based a, on that's a really balls? important point and we probably should do more work on that. So I did my PhD work in the smell ophiolite in Oman looking at tracing natural carbon storage and formation of carbonate veins. And you get these amazing travertine carbonates that precipitate out of natural groundwaters that have pH 12. It's quite an extraordinary system. And one of the big questions there and criticisms of a lot of the work is that there was concern because the ultramafic ophiolite rocks um, are being abducted nearby limestones. People were wondering, well, is it just material from the limestones recirculating, so are you just dissolving CO2? And so we had to do a lot of work in terms of the hydrology and the tracing to prove that no, actually the carbonates are forming um, within the peridotites and it's, it's a net drawdown of CO2. It's not a dissolution of something and a reprecipitation, but that is obviously a concern. And a lot of kimberlites are located near limestone. So that's something you need, need to consider. I guess um, if we can figure out how the reactions work and we can supply the CO2 from the atmosphere from concentrated streams, it almost doesn't matter. But it is something that I think is, is a question that needs some, some more work. I don't know if um, you've done any mass bounce calculations. Again, there's been very little work done on yellow ground. Not on, not on those synchrotrons. Wherever that calcium's coming from, it's, it's, it's such a massive amount of calcium. I. I just assumed that it was from groundwater. I hadn't, I'm not too sure how to address that. Yeah, I would need to think, think, about, think about tracing that some more, but it's a really good point, Rick. Okay, um, I've got one quick question as well. I guess um, there's more of an emphasis now on, on waste streams. Um, we do work here as well. Um, there's been quite a lot of focus on the use of microbes in bioleaching, for example. Do you think we're going to see an expansion into a commercial avenue where people may be tailoring microbes specifically for this purpose, as opposed to just relying on the natural community? Do you think we might be looking at an introduced um, 
set of microbes that perform specific tasks that are based on an amenability test to those microbes so in the future yeah it's, it's a really good point i'll let jordan and tom comment in a moment because they're the expert on microbes but i think there's a lot of cross-discipline work that could be done and learning from that field bioleaching is a really big field with diamond mining i don't think we're going to bioleach out the diamonds so it um, maybe isn't something that we focus on as much other than learning about what microbes are good at eating up ultramorphic rocks however um, for other commodities where you have metals in there you know there are some potential where could you design a heap leaching system where you are able to leach out the metals and at the same time also store carbon that's an interesting potential area of research i don't know much about that but i would think at a lot of metal mines there would be potential to look at that and potentially um, carbonate your tailings and also turn them into additional revenue stream at the same time. Tom, do you want to comment some more on the potential of introducing microbes? Yeah, well, I don't think we'll be bioleaching the kimberlite in these areas. It's just so buffering. But I think the thing that we're thinking about with this uh, study is that it's a really harsh place to live. You know, it gets above 40 and to zero degrees on these. So we kind of had to start with what was living there. So that's, that's why we went to the mine and collected from there and then grew up our consortia based on that. So that's kind of where we started with introducing, yeah, introducing stuff is always scary. So that's kind of the road that we went down. Right, I, I went down the what's happening naturally road uh, because so in, in heat bleaching, we it's not just one bug that's doing all the work it's it's a um it's at least three um and they're working together to do something so if we perform metagenomics later on down the road uh we can find out what the bugs which bugs are doing what and to target them and then create an artificial family to make them do what we want them to do um, but i don't think i'll be able to achieve that in my short time in a PhD. Great question, Nathan. Okay. Um, any last minute burning questions from the floor? If not, we can bring it to a close. And um, if you stick around for some tea and biscuits, then we can probably harangue you for more questions then. So um, if you could just join me in thanking our speakers, Evelyn, Tom, and Jordan, one more time. Thank you. Thank you.